together. So we want to um, focus on each aspect, but at the same time, uh, we want to uh, look at ourselves and look at uh, human learning uh, with the awareness that um, they cannot be separate. Each aspect is important, but you know, um, all the aspects they need to um, be uh, considered they need to be taken into consideration in order to um, come up with the, the valid uh, perspective. And, you know, um, especially when we try to apply these theories um, into practice, we um, have to be mindful of the fact that um, all of these different aspects, all different angles, uh, we need to consider. So we're going to talk about uh, personality and behaviors today. But before we do that, let's start with a word of prayer. So um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, God who heals, God who restores, God who brings miracles, God who is life, God who is hope, and Lord, God who is holy. Father, we come before you, uh, although we are unworthy, Lord, um, thank you for giving us your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, so that anyone who believes in him as Lord and Savior will not perish but have eternal life. And Father, thank you for paving the way for us, tearing down the walls, and also tearing the, the curtain between the Holy of the Holies and the Holy Place so that we can freely, boldly enter into your presence, O oh God. What a great privilege, and Lord, we don't uh, take it for granted. But Holy Spirit, uh, remind us of what a great privilege that is and help us be thankful each moment we remember. Um, help us remember where we were saved from and um, and just the privilege of knowing God and calling him as a father. Lord, help us also leave behind all the patterns of life that are not pleasing to you so that we can run forward, run uh, toward the cross of God with all our might. Um, just uh, uh, taking off, shaking off all the things that entangle us. Lord, uh, may you teach us um, good things and help us come to uh, aware of human development and, and a bigger picture of who we are and who we are in you. Thank you for creating us by this special life that is precious. Uh, and uh, Lord, help us understand that each one of us uh, is valued and just before your eyes and that uh, we're called for a bigger purpose than even self-actualization. Uh, we're called to do something bigger than uh, barely making a living and surviving, but rather we're called to be the salt and light to the world, to reflect your image, to be your ambassadors, bringing positive changes where we, wherever we are and bringing life where there is no life. Father, empower us. And we're inspired with this power. We thank you in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start with Matthew chapter 8. This is a little different uh, passage, but we talked about Genesis. We talked about, um, we talked quite a bit about uh, Jacob's story that includes uh, the 12 sons and especially Joseph. And now is the time for us to turn to something different. Um, these are, by the way, all uh, connected to uh, worries and concerns of this life. Um, you know, even as uh, Jacob's family was just uh, um, um, was a continuation of like dysfunction after dysfunction, uh, brokenness, but also it's a reflection of God's working in their lives and in their hearts so that you know the broken family comes together in one piece and um, you know um, they a 
come to reconcile. They they come to ask for forgiveness, being forgiven, and being reconciled with each other. Also, at the same time, um, they're also showing us that um, the Christ to come, the Messiah. Uh, you know, what kind of Messiah that we're going to have, right? Through Joseph, the foreshadow, the, the type of Christ, a type of Christ. Um, God is showing us what kind of Messiah we will have in the future from that pers from that point on, uh, fr from that point of perspective. Um, and, um, you know, we also talked about how worried each person could be and last time in particular, we talked about um, how to deal with misbeliefs and replacing those uh, unhealthy misbeliefs that really uh, bind us, that, that make us uh, freeze, that, um, that entangles us. Um, how to actually uh, battle with that, how to, how to deal with that in order to have healthier, more constru constructive, Biblical way of thinking, so that we'll have um, less anxiety, but have more hope and um, courage, and that will be empowered, right? And then later on, we'll be able to um, behave, you know, in a healthier manner. And then our being, our doing, actually affects other people around us for sure, and um, there's a ripple effect. So we want to remain calm, we want to um, be a buffer, and we want to also draw healthy boundaries in order to um, create healthy dynamics that will lead to a healthier and um, healthy relationship um, to promote trust, to, um, to promote consistency and Um, and uh, also uh, perseverance, you know, um, and just uh, uh, love that lasts, right? To demonstrate love that lasts, the, that will be um, cons consistently available, right? To um, help others and support others around us. We also want to make sure that we're supported as well. And um, we're created to be interdependent human beings, and we um, need somebody to lean on, to to um, uh, to depend on, um, and we depend on each other, right? Um, not to say that we rely more on people than than God. You know, we turn to God. Um, we turn to God first, and then we need to understand that. Uh, those helpers and uh, supporters, they are given by God. God gives and takes away, right? It's not that God exists and then um, all other people. No, uh, everything comes from God, even the people around us. And so um, there are times when God talks up, even um, those people around us. There's like a really dark season. Um, say you used to have many acquaintances and friends, now like, Okay, where's everybody? You know, um, he, he gives you those moments to um, let you know that to let us know that that we're not supposed to um, rely on people more than rely on God. Um, he wants us to understand that even people come from God. And um, he wants us to learn to consult him before concerning people. And so, um, yeah, it, it's not it's not a pleasant period of time, but um, people do go through that, and we come to aware. Oh, you know what? Um, God really is a God, and is God, and that um, He's the constant. Um, he's everlasting, and He's always available. I just need to sharpen my sense, spiritual sense, so that um, I can hear him better and uh, so that I can trust him better um, in times when I feel like he's hiding his face.
So having said that, uh, we're going to read uh, Matthew chapter 8. Um, this is a series of events that took place. Why are they uh, juxtaposed one after another, you know, like put together in the manner that it is? Um, we'll, we'll think about that. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. And Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So in this um, short description of what happened, it was a very dramatic you know, moment. Leprosy was a skin disease. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit different than uh, Hansen disease that we know of today. Um, that is um, uh, incurable and pretty um, destructive, right? It, the damages are pretty good, uh, pretty deep, right? Um, so skin disease, but it was uh, back in those days, it, it, it's a skin disease, not Hansen disease, but it's severe enough that they had to be quarantined, they had to isolate themselves from the rest of the community. Um, they uh, were treated as unclean, uh, spiritually unclean people and they had to, when they go out on the street, they had to shout out, you know, um, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine yourself doing that? It, it's a shame that you have to put on yourself um, and let people know. And you are definitely Isolated from the community, you can't even go back to your own family, and certainly you cannot participate in worship, right? That's another isolation, and um, so these people, uh, I'm pretty much, you know, their destiny is set. You know, you're gonna uh, miss people all the rest of your life, and you're gonna just live as a leper. So, um, hence, this person, a leper, um, knows that no doctor can heal him. Right, so he actually uh, heard something about Jesus that uh, Jesus does not, not does not mind <laughs> dealing with unclean people. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees and other spiritual leaders were afraid, and uh, also they uh, put the laws first um, rather than loving people. Right, and so um, these people are pretty much neglected and uh, given up. Now. Um, he came to Jesus because he heard that Jesus heals people, that he does not mind being around unclean people. So um, he came and knelt before him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cleansed of his leprosy. So um, in a different version, um, he, he says, you know, what do you mean uh, if I can um, or if I'm willing, you know, of course, um, there's nothing um, that I can't do um, and um, be healed, right? Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Um, Jesus, um, probably, probably, it's, um, I'm guessing that he knew uh, this leper, he came to this town um, at that hour on that street knowing that the leper needed help and he was right there. I'm willing. Be clean. And just like the, you know, God our Father spoke the world into being, when Jesus says he has the same authority, he says, be clean. Then this person is clean, right? Immediately. It doesn't happen two years later. It, it happens right, right there then. Doesn't mean that our prayers um, are answered immediately, and some of them are, but um, sometimes it takes time. It's different than when Jesus speaks that. So then, is Jesus not willing to help us when we cry out in our prayers, especially the desperate ones? He is listening, um, but just like Daniel chapter ten, there's a prince of Persia that uh, blocks our way, blocks the. Uh, angel of God uh, coming through 
And so on day one, God is listening and he knows our prayers. He knows even before a word is in our mouth, but um, we don't understand. Uh, we sometimes forget the fact that there are battles going on in the heavenly realm. That's why we need to pray and um, engage in the warfare. So there are times when um, his answers are kind of delayed, um, but in Christ, our prayers are yet, um, yes and amen. Our requests have been granted. We need to believe that and press on when it's to press on with prayers when it's to um, persevere. But immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Can you imagine an incurable disease? And whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so my my skin that used to be white and red and all that oh, it's so clean and I know I am healed. And Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. It's not his time yet. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift. Why? Because, you know, the priest used to be the ones who were given this kind of diagnostic role. And um, if you have a, an illness that separates you from the rest of the community, you know, by being unclean, I think it was a great, great way to keep everyone healthy, right? Um, but then you need to go to the priest, present yourself, and um, they need to diagnose you. Um, you have been restored. We, you have been healed. Um, and then bring a gift of Moses. I, I know you're healed, even before the priest actually diagnosed you as such. Bring your gift as a testimony. And he probably did, right? And though he didn't tell anybody else, probably the word spread out because this person now uh, doesn't have to say unclean, unclean. He probably doesn't live in that uh, old um, street, you know, without a home. Uh, or surrounded by other lepers, now he could go back home now and find his family. And so this is not just physical healing, but relational healing, psychological, right, emotional. So then we see at the beginning of this passage, someone who knocks on the door, asking with faith, you can heal me if you, if you want to. I'm willing, I'm willing, of course, to heal. So uh, go and ask, right? I can heal you, even if your illness has been uh, a long time or if it's incurable by the world's definition. Now the second story is about the faith of the centurion. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? How kind he is. So that's right. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And now that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go! Let it be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was healed at that moment. Another healing story. What is different about this? It's also about faith. Okay, before it was a leper, uh, outcast, unaccepted, unapproachable, uh, untouchable. Now we're talking about a centurion who is um, the opposite of the case, um, who is uh, who is given power and authority, Roman official, centurion, a centurion has like a hundred soldiers under him, and uh, 
the leadership and um, you know um, he's a leadership and he um, understands commands and obedience and um, chain of command um, and loyalty and all that right now um, he started with Jesus as well um, so the Roman Empire knew about Jesus um, many of them actually wanted to follow him but probably out of their you know because there's like a loyalty conflict and there's uh, um, fear issues you know like the um, Nicodemus you know, he was a uh, part of Sanhedrin he was a high official and he couldn't dare to come to see Jesus during the daytime so he chose the night time when nobody was out and everyone was asleep um, but the centurion was not afraid when Jesus had entered the pair and uh, her name when Jesus had entered the Pernaeum, Jeff says he entered, you know, like, what a timing. We're talking about divine appointments. We're talking about a divinely coordinated event. A centurion, the Roman commander, came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. So we can tell from this, he, he has heard about Jesus. He is bold enough. And humble enough to let go of his um, title and authority to come to prostrate before Jesus um, knowing that Jesus is not just a regular person uh, knowing that although Jesus didn't have anything <laughs> that is uh, uh, glamorous or desirable in human eyes he knew that he was a uh, um, person of uh, high status uh, not in the world sense but it's just very noble that um, he was different that um, he was someone that he should bow, bow before he, he knew about that right and of course um, someone with the healing ability and so another thing that we know about him is that he Said, my servant lies at home paralyzed suffering terribly you know this servant so a couple of things the servant must be very important in his life right um otherwise you know because servants and slaves or you know and women were treated as properties um they didn't have any rights he did not have to show concern he did not have to worry about it if they got sick right um but he came for the sake of this servant he must be very important um, or this centurion must be really caring this uh, centurion knows um, all about his servants lives um, genuinely interested in their uh, um, welfare and success and he um, is an uh, other oriented person you know, he doesn't pray about, he doesn't request prayer for his own, uh, his own, uh, own life or his, his, you know, direct family or anything like that. He, um, brings up, you know, this concern to Jesus. He, the reason he ran all he could, you know, as fast as he could to Jesus is to, uh, help this servant uh, live again, right? And so he's a caring person. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? So he saw um, that this centurion um, showed on his face, like, you know, I'm really concerned and, and please, please help me. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Jesus was not saying that, okay, so, you know, like the most of the doctors, like, let him come to me. No, he said, shall I come and heal him? What a humble God we have. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word. And my servant will be healed. He uh, is a centurion who uh, commands other people and he acknowledges Jesus' authority. Although, like, he wasn't wearing fancy clothes again at, at all, like, um, actually, what he was wearing 
was an undergarment. Uh, the, 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 the picture of Jesus that we have uh, is his undergarment. And um, his outer cloak, um, he was actually uh, hanging it over his um, shoulder like this. And that's considered as a sash, but it's not a sash. It's, uh, <laughs> it's his outer garment. Um, and probably it was his blanket when he was sleeping yeah, in the wilderness. <laughs> because um, he didn't have a home. He said, foxes have a home, birds have a home, I don't have a home. Um, and so, he was amazed because this centurion is not even a Jew, uh, not one of his disciples yet. And uh, I just know that I'm a man under authority. I, I have power and authority. I, I tell this one, go, and he goes, come, and he comes. And I say, um, do this and he, he does this. So I know that you are a, a person of authority and power. Um, I can't figure out who you are, but you have the leadership force in you. Um, you know, so um, I don't really, and, and by the way, I, I think you are very, very, very. Um, magnificent, holy uh, person above human beings. And um, so I do not deserve to have you come into my group. Um, you must be um, treated with honor and respect uh, better than my household. So you can just say the word and my servant will be healed. And uh, Jesus was surprised because, uh, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. How is it that the Gentiles have, uh, who we barely started uh, reaching out, know God better than you do? I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will take their places that they feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, um, so Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they are uh, Hebrews, right? But there will be non-Hebrews taking up um, their seats in the, um, the banquet of the Lamb, right? And um, who are these people then? The Gentiles, right? The Gentiles uh, whom God always had in mind to share the gospel with, to, uh, to include and embrace. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be um, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So uh, this is not the subjects of uh, these are not the subjects of the kingdom of heaven, but rather um, they're the subjects of the kingdom in a sense um, that they actually look, uh, they actually follow and obey the spirit of darkness, which is uh, the, the one who opposes God, where there will be need, need, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, it will be so sad and so uh, you feel so abandoned that you're gonna start crying, but uh, gnashing of teeth like you, you won't be able to get out of that, you know, place until uh, so then it's the best it's the best if you don't go there. Right? So then. Um, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So you want your servant to be healed? He's he healed right now at this moment. And probably the centurion went back and checked that servant was well right at the moment when Jesus was speaking this. And then, um, it, it leads to another. So the Roman centurion was certainly not part of Hebrews. He was not a Jew. He doesn't belong to the people of God, but um, 
Um, he understood the spiritual principles. He had greater faith in Jesus than most of the Jews did. And so then Jesus, Jesus didn't even have to go there because the centurion had this faith. Like, just say the word. We know that by, by, by the script spoken, when you, when you speak it, it comes true. I can believe that. Do we believe when Jesus has spoken a word to us, uh, regardless of the situations, like the centurion servant was dying, uh, suffering terribly, he was paralyzed, right? Uh, not in a good state. If you have those circumstances, um, you know, uh, is Jesus still willing to heal? Is Jesus still close to us? Can we be healed? You know, can our loved ones be healed by the power of Jesus? And uh, can he heal people when they don't, don't fully know him? Because, you know, the Roman soldier, the Roman centurion had certain understanding of Jesus, but that was certainly a very small portion of, um, a small part of who Jesus was and how he was like. The next passage talks about Jesus healing many. So, like, continues on uh, to talk about his healing one after another, right? When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. Um, this house actually exists in Israel, if you go there, and uh, people all uh, talk about this um, little biblical story where uh, Peter was, Peter's mother-in-law was uh, healed. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to want, wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with the word, and healed all the sick. This was fulfilled, what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. So he healed people, many, and especially uh, demon possessed, uh, who could not be healed in a different way uh, by a different person. So people started just bringing like you know hospital beds and um, just. Uh, uh, people with incurable diseases or uh, demon possessed because uh, Jesus would cast out demons. So Isaiah, that he took up, he, Isaiah 53, right? And that was a prophetic message about the Messiah. And Jesus, by the way, fits this, um, these characters. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Who took up? Our infinite infirmities as Jesus, Messiah, took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. So uh, we may not be really familiar with this passage, but then uh, if um, the, the Jewish people are very famous, so if you bring this passage, tell them no uh, reference, they're going to say, oh, it's about the Messiah. It's just that the Messiah has not come from their perspective. Then um, it talks about faith and healing, right? And um, and then uh, Jesus gradually reveals himself to be the Messiah. Then it talks about the cost of following the Messiah. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. So we're talking about Galilee Lake, which looks like an ocean. And a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And the disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their own dead. Wow, it could be it, it could sound really um heartless. But well, why is he saying that? So, um, so wherever he went, he was surrounded by crowd who needed him, who needed to see his miracles, he is uh, healing, and also who needed to um, go in just in case, like he's a uh, privileged person, you know, like I, I would decide to. I mean, some of his disciples actually thought of this. You're going to be a great king. Take my power and 
Uh, let him sit uh, on your right and let him sit on your left. <laughs> um, but um, he was sometimes sur surrounded by the crowd and he wasn't necessarily um, operating by the pressure of the crowd, but rather he was uh, completely led by the Holy Spirit. He gave orders to cross the, to the other side of the lake. Why? Um, here's a reason. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Do you know um, what the cost of following me is? Uh, it's going to be a great cost because I don't even have a home. I choose not to have a home. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. So, um, you know, he's dealing with different types of people who uh, brings in challenges. Okay, so I want to follow you, but first let me go and bury my father. Uh, it's an important thing, right? Uh, especially in an Asian culture uh, or Middle Eastern culture, you, you got to um, take good care of your family and uh, especially funeral, like you need to take care of. But Jesus told him, what, follow me, like right now. And let the dead bury their own dead. What do you mean by that? Well, it sounds really cruel, but he's saying, you know, if you know me and if you want to follow me, then you must have been saved. You must have been on the track of salvation. Now, um, your other people, uh, your, your father you're talking about, um, he doesn't know me and he, you know, many of uh, whom you're referring to have uh, passed away and they cannot follow me. And also, uh, because they're already dead, you cannot uh, challenge that. Let the dead bury their own dead. So, um, you mean like the uh, those who are following me, they are in life. But otherwise, other other people, um, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, then actually you are spiritually dead. So then, of course, then your your father is dead. Um, he uh, he doesn't know me, and he doesn't have life, and he is. Uh, spiritually dead then let the spiritually dead actually bury the spiritual spiritually dead you're awake and you need to be with me and it's part of the following Jesus you know the cost of following Jesus then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so it talked about um, the cost of following Jesus and then he it continues to talk about uh, the fact that you know, following Christ requires not just uh, um, it, it's not just costly, but it does take uh, faith every time. But Jesus was sleeping. Um, so, what's the situation here? They got on the boat. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake. It said that the waves swept over the boat. So the boat is partially sinking. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves. It was completely calm. So, uh, you of little faith, uh, you have almost no faith, right? Because you just saw how many people I healed and I was willing to um, even bless uh, these people. You know, by healing and then uh, encouragement and restoring them to their community. But um, these people are not even like the Jews, but you guys are Jews and you, you have been with me all along. But why are you so afraid? And he got up and rebuked the winds and waves, and it was completely calm. Then the men, these disciples, were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? They still think of him as a, an absurd, ordinary man. Uh, not necessarily as divine. Even the winds and the waves obey him. Then, um, then there's another uh, episode of healing. So, the so the previous passage emphasizes the fact that um, Jesus calms the storm, and you know the disciples start wondering, who is this person? Uh, certainly, he's not a regular man like us. Now, uh, 
verse 28, when he arrived at the other side of the region of the garrison, uh, Gedarian, uh, two demons this man, coming from the, coming from the tombs, met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with the Son of God? He shouted, have you come here to torture us for the appointed time? The appointed time. They already know the destiny. Um, they know uh, that uh, sooner or later, the, the end of the world is going to come and uh, let every person rise up from their um, their tomb and they become uh, resurrected bodies. And um, at that time, people are going to all stand before God, the Father as a judge. At that time, he's not the Father, he's a judge. And uh, we have to stand before him and give an account of what we have done, what we have not done. And then he's going to... Um, Say, all right. So you're going to uh, join heaven, um, and or you, you're going to go down to um, the hell. And so the appointed time is when his children, God's children, are gathered up to be lifted up. Um, but then um, the appointed time also refers to the fact that, that Satan will be um, will come to an end. And that in that appointed time, no matter how sweet she was and whatever uh, she has done uh, great, um, the appointed time comes and um, the enemy, this is the time when um, all of us will be uh, judged according to what we have done and what we have not done. And the appointed time for the enemy to, um, to uh, receive the final um, judgment saying uh, guilty and you're going down to the pit of destruction and you're going to be destroyed forever. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Um, he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those taking the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this including what happened to the demon-possessed man. But the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. So the final episode, uh, Jesus heals wherever he goes, right? But each incident, we see uh, why he healed, and who he healed, what he said to those who... Um, you know, like went to, to his disciples, like uh, all these other people, like the Roman centurion and uh, lepers, actually knew uh, Jesus' ability and they uh, hang on to him. Versus his disciples are afraid, like, why are you uh, sleeping? Like, um, could you see that we're about to die? And then there's another healing incident um, the two demon possessed men. Um, there's a reason why uh, the Matthew. Um, version of the gospel compared to um, other gospels that talk about the same episodes um, keep saying there are two men two people two you know two people who came uh, some scholars say that um, compared to say um, mark you know mark and version of the gospel or the same uh, story you know matthew uh, was more in detail you know either he copied from the mark and version saying or the source of you, uh, saying that, um, you know, um, you know, uh, there's a demon possessed man. So, say, you know, the Mark and Virgin talks about one man, and then the uh, Matthew version talks about two men in the same episode. Um, it doesn't mean that any version is wrong, but it's just that Matthew got to see two of them, and uh, Mark actually saw one, and so they were telling the truth. Or some scholars actually say uh, th there's a little more than that. You know, uh, the reason Matthew wrote uh, two men and two people is because when there, there is uh, one or two people, there, there's like more than two people, they can bear witnesses, right? So then um, this is truly witnessed by uh, at least two people, and so this is uh, actually what happened, what, what actually happened. And so trying to reassure the um, later audience. When they arrived at the other side of the region of the uh, Gedrins, two demons of this man are coming from the tombs 
Okay, they were so violent that no one could pass that way. Why do you want, uh, what do you want with the Son of God? They shouted. So even the demons actually now and call him as Son of Man, Son of God, right? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? We know where we're supposed to be going in the end. But before our time comes, like, are you here to torture us? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, so the uh, pigs were demonized, right? If you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. Um, so and not, not the pigs are demonized yet, but the uh, demon possessed men. He was cleansed, and the spirits uh, need to find something to attach on, something physical to attach. To, in order to survive. So uh, there's a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. Um, because they requested that, and you know, uh, rather than going to a person to, um, you know, uh, not just embarrass them, but you know, to, um, to torture him forever so that he will remain uh, insane. Uh, it's better for the pigs uh, to be killed, right? So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this. Like, see this? Like, this is crazy. We can't believe this. Explain what happened to the demon possessed man. So the demon possessed was uh, in right mind. He was wearing clothes. Like before, he wasn't wearing clothes. He was. He looked like he was completely out. But actually, he was uh, trying to uh, do something right now, and um, and uh, yeah. So then, his his in the right mind. That's like a an unbelievable thing. And and then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. Look what he has done. Uh, I yeah. It, let's just go, go check him out. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Instead of like uh, worshiping, instead of uh, uh, saying thank you for saving lives, uh, because there was such a uh, great econ economical loss, you know, their parents all died. And so they pleaded with him to leave their region uh, because they are less happy about, less concerned about uh, people dying. Uh, but he, um, They, they were less concerned about uh, people being healed, but they were more concerned about the money itself, monetary loss. So then, um, when we do God's work as well, people may uh, tell you, you know what, this is not what we um, thought it should be. Uh, whether theologically that like, sound or not, I, I don't care. This is what we need, and if you can't do it, then um, maybe we should start all over again. Uh, can you please leave, leave us? So basically, um, out of their mentory loss, they had to ask uh, Jesus to leave. Jesus is all about um, freeing setting people free and to um, to show them who Father God is. So I want us to personally meditate on the on this passage, particularly. Um, and so let's take a deep breath. Um, and let the word of God wash over you. The first time I read it for you. This is going to uh, be a time when we just, you know, um, immerse in the word and let the word wash over you. Let's take a deep breath, uh, the, uh, you know, counting six. Okay, inhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, 
exhale. One, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, God's goodness, His joy, His holiness, His uh, justice, His mercy, His uh, uh, delight, His love, His protection. And let's breathe out a sense of loss, fear, lack of clarity, or uh, lack of guidance, lack of solid self, discouragement, disillusionment. Let's breathe in. God's goodness, His healing, restoration, His goodness, His grace, and even anointing and um, uh, physical heal 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 um, healing as well. And then let's breathe out our selfishness, misunderstanding. Something that um, God does not uh, need to be a thought or word. Let's breathe in God's goodness, His mercy, His grace, strength. Let's breathe out our own plans our stubbornness, lack of love for God, and um, taking the matter into our own hands uh, and more. Just breathing. So uh, keep counting, keep breathing. And um, while you're keeping to breathe, I'm going to actually read. Matthew chapter 8. Verses 5. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The second time I read it for you, 
Let's pay attention to something that stands out to us. It could be an image, it could be a word or a phrase. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done, just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So the third time I read it for you, let's lift up the thing that stood out to you to God and ask him, what does this mean? Why did you give this word or image and phrase to me? When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but, I just, say the, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Surely I tell you, 
I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done, just as you believe it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. As I read it for the fourth time from the Message Bible, um, it's called Arresting God's Presence in, in His Word. As Jesus entered the village of Capernaum, a Roman captain came up in a panic and said, Master, my servant is sick. He can't walk. He's in terrible pain. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. Oh no, said the captain, I don't want to put you to all that trouble. Just give the order and my servant will be fine. I'm a man who takes orders and gives orders. I tell one soldier, go, and he goes. To another, come, and he comes. To my slave, do this, and he does it. Taken aback, Jesus said, I've yet to come across this kind of simple trust in Israel. The very people who are supposed to know all about God and how he works. This man is the vanguard of many outsiders who will soon to soon be coming from all directions, streaming in from the east, pouring in from the west, sitting down at God's kingdoms, uh, God's kingdom banquet alongside Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those who grew up in the faith, but had no faith, will find themselves out in the cold, outsiders to grace and wondering what happened. And Jesus turned to the captain and said, Go, what you believe would happen has happened. At that moment, his servant became well. So we're moving on to uh, talk about personality and behaviors because, you know, behaviors are um, uh, affected by our personality, right? So um, people can be doing engaging in the same behaviors, but they their thought processes and their uh, feelings may be different. Um, on the other hand, um, they may have the same type of feelings. Uh, but they have different reactional behaviors too, right? So um, personality uh, comes into play. And uh, so uh, you've probably heard DISC analysis a lot before. And um, what does D stand for, right? D stands for dominant. And then um, I stand 
stands for inspiring. And it stands for supportive. And then uh, C stands for cautious. Okay, so and then um, these are the four uh, different personality types. And um, so then uh, what is dominant? Dominant person is motivated by, so each person is motivated by different things, right? Uh, you know, dominant person is motivated by solving problems like, okay, oh, if there's a problem, oh, you know what? I want one, I want to go ahead um, and tackle it. I know how to solve. And then conquering challenging situations. Oh, there's an issue. Oh, this is a very difficult situation. I can do it, you know, just so they just uh, uh, rise up, you know, to the situations. And we, we sometimes see these people, right? And they're like, oh, we're really thankful. These people are courageous <laughs> and uh, they have the brain, they have the ability to tend to um, solve this, but it's not not just about the abilities, but it's rather their personality, right? Yeah, I'm gonna just take, tackle it um, and get the results. Yeah, I can get that done. You know, I can get that done. Um, versus inspiring uh, person is motivated by the opportunity to ins interact with people. So these are more relational people, right? So dominant person um, seems to be. Uh, more task oriented but uh, uh, inspiring people tend to be more relational um, they are motivated by public recognition um, and then uh, varied activities because activities um, give you an opportunity to engage with other people uh, meet different kinds of people perhaps so people oriented right how about supportive people they're motivated by teamwork the opportunity to help others because you know it's all about th these people are also people oriented but um, feeling appreciated for their contribution um, supportive people tend to be a little more uh, about the support um, versus inspiring people can um, uh, it, they don't have to be supportive right they don't have to take on the supportive role but rather, uh, they're drawn to the opportunity to interact with other people. They can they can be kind of dominant, uh, but just moti more motivated by people, right? Uh, cautious people are motivated by structuring or organizing things, researching or searching for information, finding the right solution for a problem. So these are not the exhaustive list of personality, of course, but um, someone who came up with uh, this analysis actually defined this. And then there are uh, four different um, behavioral styles. So um, one is uh, analytical. And the third is um, driver and then expressive. So analytical, um, the description is they're noted for the ability to gather and review data so sort of like cautious people right um, typical for people in technical positions such as engineering accounting and information technology details and accuracy are important take great pride in providing information that is correct yeah and then uh, what kinds of skills do they have spending extra time to make sure things are right yeah they 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 are bothered by like the gaps or uh, discrepancies and they need to get it right orderly and present um, present ideas or solutions in an orderly manner they can come across as indecisive because they are kind of considering different factors and they need to do it right you know 
Um, the downside is can the critical of solutions that veer from what the facts say. Yeah. So the, their favorite word is why. <laughs> and their performance can be maximized if you allow them sufficient time to gather and interpret information. Versus um, amiable people. Um, these people are highly supportive individuals interested in establishing and maintaining relationships. So like, um, like supportive people, right? Um, typical of employees in human resources and social or medical services. So what kinds of skills do they have? Achieving consensus within an organization, like that's their gifting. Um, they effectively facilitate groups and bring sides together to develop a win-win solution. This is very much needed, right? However, the downside is uh, they desire to reach agreement may cause their desire to reach agreement may cause the person to conform too easily. Yeah, so they are people oriented. They are mindful. Um, we we want to make sure that nobody is hurt. <laughs> So then, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll just go with you. I'll just go with you just to give you a vote so that it'll be easier for you to reach an agreement. Um, the favorite word is we, and their performance is maximized if you allow them to initiate and stand behind their ideas. If you allow them to maintain relationships in the organization. So, um, So allowing them to initiate and stand behind their ideas. Um, so they, they can present their ideas, but their interest is maintaining relationships, right? Yeah. And then a driver, okay, driver, well, that sounds kind of driving. The description is the driving force behind getting things done in an organization, sort of like dominant personality, right? Results oriented individuals who are motivated by goals, like I'm going to get that done, like, you know, and uh, they might be even good at, um, even in the meetings, right? Uh, but these, uh, because they are just uh, looking at the goals and we're going to just accomplish this together. However, um, they might need the company of amiable people so that um, in the process, no, no one will be actually uh, get left, left behind or get hurt. They gravitate to positions in manage, management and sales. Yeah, because they need to get things done. Uh, all kinds of skills. Effective at time management. Yeah, they're, they're just like, okay, go, go, go. All right, get done by this hour and we're going to do it, uh, make it happen. They tend to be decisive. Um, the opposite of the relational people, right? But the downside is they may neglect the impact that uh, of their decisions, you know, or their actions have on others. Yeah, can be overlooked, not overlooked. So favorite word is when. Yeah. And their performance can be maximized if you give them options and probabilities. If you allow them to formulate their own decisions uh, whenever possible. So they're goal oriented, and so like if you set the goals clearly, or if you give them clear options, that would be easier for them. And then expressive people, um, their company visionaries, good at grasping the big picture. Like this is the big picture. All right, so we're talking about this, but this is like one only uh, what aspect? Like this one of the aspects. Um, have you considered the others? Um, and you know, this is this is like. This is where we want to get at. Yeah. Uh, gravitate to positions in marketing and strive to get ahead in an organization. The politicians in an organization. So they're very good at communicating as well, right? Um, the visionaries. And then, um, what kinds of skills do they have? They develop new concepts and they have the ability to size up a situation based on personal experience. 
So you know what, based on my experience, like I've, I've had a similar, similar experience or like I have an experience that can be applied to this situation. You know, like this is like generally what the big picture is and this is how I handled and I think we can go for that direction. So like trying to persuade people, right? Uh, with their expressive gifting. The downside is being so confident of their gut feelings. Like I've done this, been there, done that, you know, like let's, let's do this. They may often ignore on, or neglect facts that are presented to them. So actually, you know, it's case by case. This case is quite different than their previous experience, but they just take a stab at it and then say, you know what, I know how to do it. It's my gut feeling is this. Um, but then the, the little facts that were kind of different, you know, that make your, your new case different than old case, um, can make you trip. Lack of attention to detail is also an, another downside. Favorite word is I. I know this. Okay. And then their performance can be maximized if, if show interest in their ideas and compliment them. Oh, you have a wonderful idea. So then, you know, um, we want to all grow, right? Um, um, the, you know, part of the reason we study the life span development is because we want to grow, uh, not just physically, but also in our, um, in our identity formation, in our spiritual aspect, um, relationally, um, psychologically, we want to grow. So then, um, how do you foster an environment conducive to growth? Um, it's, it has to do with self-esteem, it has to do with uh, locus of control, like who controls it. Um, is that internally or is that externally, you know, like, um, we're going to talk a little more about this when, you, when you're more internally uh, motivated and when you're, when you have a sense of control on your own, then you tend to be more motivated, but we'll, we'll talk about this. Introversion, extroversion, okay. So introverts uh, tend to focus their energies inwardly and have a greater sensitivity to abstract feelings. And extroverts direct more of their attention to other people, objects, and events. And uh, there's a difference between authoritarianism and dogmatism. Authoritarianism is um, an individual orientation toward authority. So, um, how authoritarian are you, right? You could be demanding, directive, controlling of her subordinates, submissive and differential toward superiors, so like the, there's a hierarchy like you. You guys need to uh, respect and you need to report to me every once in a while. And I do the same for my superiors. Intellectually rigid, they tend to have like this rules. They're fearful of social change highly judgmental and categorical in reaction to others. Okay, so you, oh, all right, so you're this type of person, aren't you? <laughs> um, uh, and then they can be distrustful and hostile in response to restraint. And then dogmatism, a particular cognitive style that is characterized by Close-mindedness and inflexibility. So, like, um, yeah, um, uh, they, they tend to make decisions quickly based on only limited information and with a high degree of confidence in the correctness of their decisions. Yeah. So, I think there's a similarity between um, expressive people and uh, dogmatism people. Um, Or, but dogmatism uh, category seems to be a lot more rigid, and um, it seems like uh, they're so concerned about like, am I correct or am I not correct, right? Um, dependability is individuals who are seen as self-reliant, 
uh, responsible, consistent, and dependable. Yeah, so depending on uh, where you belong, your, your um, behaviors can come out to be kind of different, right? All right, so historical events of 7th century, uh, what happened? So before, uh, let's turn to 6th century events. Yeah, so we talked about the early Middle Ages, right? Mysticism of um, High Middle Ages. Now we're moving on to 7th century, which is uh, 600 BC or AD to 699, right? Um, Isidore, Bishop of Seville. Um, his writings provide invaluable and encyclopedic knowledge for the Middle Ages is known for important efforts to resist barbarism and heresy in Spain. Found schools and converts, um, convents and yeah, evangelized Jews. Bishop of Seville, yeah, as a writer. Now 609, uh, pagan pantheon in, pantheon in Rome consecrated as a Church of St. Maria Rotunda. As part of the dedication of Pope, a benefit confirmed All Saints Day. So if you uh, celebrate All Saints Day, it came from this uh, 609. We want to see more, more of this happening these days, right? And then organs began uh, to be used in churches before, like even an organ was um, considered as demonic, right? Uh, church bells are used to call people to worship and to give the hours to the monks in the monasteries. Yeah, certainly practical reasons, right? And then learning flourishes in Anglo-Saxon monasteries. In Century 48, Emperor Constance the, the, the II issues the typos limiting Christian teachings to that defined in the first five ecumenical councils. Pope Martin, Martin I refuses to sign typos. Martin is seized and banished to Crimea and dies. His uh, last pope to be venerated as a martyr. And then what happened? Uh, 664, after conflict between the original Celtic Church and the Roman missionaries, England uh, adopts the Roman Catholic faith in the Synod of uh, Wiki. Muhammad, 570 to 629, begins the religion of Islam, which begins to supplement Christianity across the Middle East and North Africa. 638 is Islam, Islamic capture of Jerusalem. 692 um, Anglo-Saxon bishops Kilian and Wolverhorn carry on extensive evangelism mission on the continent among the Franks. So quite a few, few things happened uh, during this time, but uh, more and more developments. Um, in terms of uh, intellectual engagement and um, And then the rise of uh, Islamic uh, religion. So then uh, we're going to move on to the next list. Uh, we're going to talk a few minutes about this and then uh, come to closure. So last time we talked about um, we talked about uh, misbeliefs, right? How to debunk or uh, look at the misbeliefs so that we can replace that with the uh, biblical truth, uh, the voice, voice of God, so that we don't um, end up engaging in more dysfunctional, uh, negative, unhealthy behaviors, right? We want to stop the negative behaviors. Negative emotions and negative behaviors. Well, when I say negative emotions, I'm not saying, okay, don't feel angry, don't feel sad, 
I'm not saying that, but then um, if it actually originated from an unreasonable misbelief, so that um, you don't have to feel so worried, we don't have to, you don't have to feel so fearful, but you are, um, it doesn't do any good to you or to other people, right? So then we want to work on that. So uh, we're going to continue. So one of the misbeliefs uh, says, God's promises sound good, but they don't work for me. God has too many big concerns to deal with. He doesn't care what I'm worried about or struggling with right now. Yeah, so these are misbeliefs because they're inconsistent with the characters that the Bible talks about, right? Uh, but, but there are times when we feel this way, right? So then uh, what, what are some of the passages that can actually help us um, debunk? God's promise of my place in the kingdom of God. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I want to read this for the second time because it's so healing, right? For, for probably many of you. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And then Romans 8, 28, um, 31 to 32. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will we not also along with him graciously give us all things. I read it for you again. This is also a very um, good passage that uh, that is worth uh, memorizing. Romans 8, 28, 31 to 20, 32. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And then Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in all the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So I'm going to read the comments for you. In every translation I've read, every copy of the Bible I picked up, I've never seen a clause added to these verses that reads, except you. 
Yeah, so we're, we're adding more resistance types, right? Yeah, that's what we add. When we thank the promises of God, the gift of His Son, the assurance of His love, are for everyone else, but not for me. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. No exceptions. No disclaimers. God's promises are ours for the taking. We didn't only open our hearts to the gift of His grace. So I understand, you know, there are those of you who might, um, who might have, um, uh, have kept your hopes high, who have um, really believed that, that God would bring forth what He has uh, promised to you. Uh, and you've been diligently praying, and you've been um, kind of searching and seeking and doing your part in order to uh, really see the fruition of it. But then, um, you know, you were just, um, um, you, you were so disappointed, like time after time. If you have gone through a series of that, uh, not just once, but it'd be very hard for you to imagine again, to, to hope again, to, because, you know, like uh, there are those people who actually say, um, I'm afraid to dream again. I'm afraid to hope again because last time I was really be, uh, I was really disappointed and uh, God's promises did not come true. And um, it's not that that person is living in sin or um, you know did anything to deserve like uh, God's curse uh, compared to other people you know um, who have received their promises, right? Um, so then you know uh, it can be very difficult for you to just like I said uh, dream again or hope up hope again. But um, we don't know why sometimes, but the Bible keeps saying, this is true. Uh, God is good and He has the best plans for us. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, He's able to do immeasurably more than what we can ask or imagine. That's, that's who He is. That's His typical character, His character that does not change. Like times may change and economy may change, uh, people around us may change, our attitudes might change, but you know he doesn't change, especially his character. Then um, we need to actually adjust our uh, perspective to that truth. That's like the plumb line, right? His word is the plumb line, and so uh, say. You know, I, I wonder if you've seen uh, online before. So a plumb line looks like this. So if you it utilizes the the principle like the uh, law of gravity, right? So here's the ceiling. So say you built a house uh, on a hill, and the hill is kind of. You know, it's hilly. <laughs> it's hilly. And so you uh, built a house here, and um, you know, it happened to be that you built a house like this. I made it kind of um, obvious for you to see that it's not level, right? And so uh, it needs to be fixed. Your house needs to be fixed because, you know, you start to feel like. You know what there's something wrong with this house i need to uh, change and so you you bring in um, uh, a designer you like a building design like a constructional um what do you call um uh construction person I, i'm forgetting the word um architect and then he brings in this thing called a plumb line so like i'm going to just magnify Enlarge this uh, picture so you can see. So here's a here's a heel, and your house is basically standing like this. All right, and there are windows and you know and doors. Um, you know there are things like on the side and things like this. So this is your house, and you uh, just want to double check. Okay. Did I do the right job? You know, <laughs> this. Oh, so you bring in uh, a 
an architect, and he brings in what? Plumb line. Here we go. So what he does is here's the ceiling, and so he hangs it right here. The plumb line is right here. So because it's a ground gate, where does it point? It points to the ground like this. It points to the ground. And so uh, then you measure the angle here, right? So, so this is 360, but this is like uh, 45 degrees here, right? And then here's uh, 135. So by this, what do you notice? You know what? It's not straight because if your house is level, then it should be that when you hold this plumb line, this should be about 90 degrees. This should be about 90 degrees. But you see that here it's like 45 and this 135 is like, oh, there's something seriously wrong. So then what, you, what do you need to do? Somehow you rebuild the house in such a manner so that uh, based on the plumb line, this is going to be 90, right? This is going to be 90, and uh, this is going to be 90, so that you know it needs to come like this. So what did, what did you just do? Okay, and, and the walls too, right? What did you just do? You measured against the exact uh, standard, <coughs> the accurate standard. So the word of God is a standard. And sometimes uh, I understand. I, I, I totally understand. Uh, maybe I should do that. Um, it's, you know, I, I read it and then just, you know, it's not going in. It's like, all right, it's like, it bounces back uh, because your life was just um, full of um, incidents and events that point toward, like, I mean, that doesn't really seem to support what the Bible says, right? But then the word of God, because it is the plumb line, we need to uh, restructure our way of thinking uh, based on the absolute standard. Yeah, so um, that's the kind of thing that we're doing with the misbeliefs. So um, I talked about misbeliefs a, a few different examples, and my prayer and hope is that you go home and actually start practicing this. And then uh, utilize these passages that we talked about in order to uh, really um, replace your misbeliefs. Yeah, let the word of God actually uh, overflow out of you. So this is you. This is you, and there's like uh, some some things that were built based on your uh, previous experiences. And let the word of God, fresh water, let fresh water just. Uh, you know, get this out, push it out. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that we're doing with uh, Miss Bullets. And so having said that, let's uh, close in prayer, um, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, being the plumb line and giving us your word so that can, we, we can measure against that plumb line our, our way of thinking and feeling and acting. Father God, we ask you that you will heal us, restore us, fix us, and God, um, and break us and mold us so that uh, we'll be rebuilt. Father God, um, welcome you. Welcome your guidance and your correction. And Father God, we ask you that um, you will reveal yourself to us so that in a way that we can understand so that uh, the scriptural truth stands out to us, that it makes sense to us, that we are able to say, yes, you know what, uh, although I had a series of events that point um, otherwise, but your character actually is uh, uh, true, consistent, uh, consistently loving, faithful, gracious, and uh, holy, just, um, there's no deceiving you, Father God. And your promises are yes and amen in faith and our journey as your children. Father God, we ask you that you will continue to bless each of you.